Hello, hello. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for coming to this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about the Cyber contract in Elixir, where the Erlang motto, let it crash, meets it shouldn't crash. And we're going to see how and why. So, I'm um, Elba Sanchez. Um, I made this talk with a coworker of mine, Guillermo Warang. Sadly, he couldn't be here today. Uh, we both work at a company named Ride. Uh, this is trying to reinvent uh, the, uh, how, we, how the people commute. Um, we want to, remo to remove one million cars from the road uh, by helping people share its own vehicles through carpooling, uh, meanwhile helping the environment. Um, here at Ride, I'm a junior software engineer and uh, we work on a, on a daily basis with Elixir Lamp. So, how did we get here? Bugs and crashes. We deal with them every day, and we try to uh, avoid having them. So who, hasn't, who has been on Dilbert's situation? I have, and maybe everyone here has. Um, in his defense, he said it hardly ever happens, but maybe he missed an edge cache when he was testing. So did you know that there were uh, really expensive software errors? Uh, like this one, the NASA Mars Climate Orbiter, uh, which crashed, it disintegrated with in and encounter Mars in a trajectory that brought it too close uh, to the planet. Why did this happen? Uh, the software put, uh, produced output in the USA customer units, uh, pound seconds, instead of the metric system units, uh, newtons, uh, newton seconds. And it was in specified in the contract between the NASA and Lockheed. Also, the Heathrow Terminal 5 opened, opening, it, mi it misplaced more than 223,000 um, uh, bags, canceled more than 500 flights, and made losses of 16 million pounds. Uh, why this? Because um, two weeks before when, uh, the opening, and they were testing, they left the testing data in the database, and when they did the opening, the system couldn't handle uh, all this, so this tra tragedy happened. Also, the Mariner 1 spacecraft, um, shortly after the rocket take uh, took over, it responded improperly to some commands that were given on, on the ground. Why? Because of a missing hyphen. So this missing hyphen costed $18.5 million. Another one, the Morris worm that was greeted not to cause damage, but to measure the size of the inter internet, it infected millions of, of computers, leaving also millionary uh, losses. And the Knight's error that costed five, uh, $440 million, and the story tells that it was a ma uh, about an unmaintained code base. This was code that haven't, hadn't been used for eight years. And uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to take the Ariane 5 fi Flight 501 case, um, where in 1996, uh, half a million software error um, caused the crash of the maiden flight of the Ariane 5 flight launcher. The rocket was reusing uh, working software from its predecessor, the Ariane 4, um, but the, its fastened engines exploited a bug um, that was not found in these previous models. Uh, so 36 seconds into its maiden launch, it crashed. So what exactly happened? Uh, the software had tried to cram a 64-bit integer uh, number into a 16-bit space. So in other words, the value that was converted was greater than uh, what can be represented in a 16-bit sign integer. So they, did, they didn't have an explicit exception handler, uh, so it followed the usual fate of an uncut exception. Um, the entire software crashed, the onboard computers crash also, and hence the whole mission crashed. So this is uh, kind of a trivial uh, 
a trivial error that we all are familiar with, but fortunately for us, the consequences are usually less expensive. So after that, um, they did some research. Um, they wrote a postmortem about this, and they, um, they said that they couldn't blame uh, management. Something clearly went wrong, but in this case, the issue was technical. They also couldn't blame the language. Um, in the used language, which was ADA, uh, the exception mechanism was not, not the best, but in this case, not all conversions were protected. They also couldn't blame the implementation. Uh, what they did was they removed uh, some conversion protection to achieve performance, but uh, this was criti criticized, but also this was justified by theoretical analysis. And they also couldn't blame testing, uh, that well, even if you can't test more, you cannot ever test at all. So what they really had to blame was their reuse specification itself. It was unacceptable in this case, the absence of any kind of precise specification associated with this reusable model. So the requirement that the horizontal bias should fit in a 16-bit uh, was in fact stated in an obscure part of the document, of the mission document, but it was nowhere to be found in the code itself. So, to the, in the sign by contract, we're going to start with a little bit of theory and going to pause the Arians uh, case here. And also start with a little bit of history. So, um, design by contract has its roots in work on formal verification and formal specification and horse logic. It is a formal system um, with a, a set of logical rules for reasoning about correctness of computer programs. So Hoare described the use of representation invariants and abstraction functions to prove correctness of abstract data types. Um, this may not say a lot right now, but um, we're going to try to explain it a little bit now. So the basics of whole logic. It is at the core of the deductive approach of design by contracts. So the central feature of horse logic is the whole triplet. Um, this triplet describes how, the, how the, exec, the execution of a piece of code changes in states of computation. Um, so, um, and horse triplet is formed by P and Q that are assertions and C that is a command. P is named a precondition and Q a post condition. And the, when the precondition is met after executing a command C, um, it establishes a post condition. So um, this whole logic is a really big set of rules uh, that provides actions. Um, it's really large, but just for the purpose of this talk, we are going to stick with the basics, the basic triplet. So there are also rules for concurrency, procedures, jumps, and pointers. So you may want to compare design by contract with, with testing, uh, but contracts, as in daily life, are assets a set of specification that covers mutual obligations, benefits, and consistency constraints that a software system has to meet. And this design by contract falls under implementation and design. Uh, so for the unit test, uh, we all know that they are used to verify that the software works correctly uh, under certain example cases and it's hard to detect all uh, possible ed cases during development. So in human affairs, uh, what is design by contract? Um, so this is an illustrating contract between an airline and a customer. For example, for me to get from Barranquilla uh, to here to San Francisco, I had the obligation as a passenger to buy an, air an airplane ticket bring acceptable baggage to the airport and be two hours uh, there before. And my rights as a client are to reach the destination. And for the airline's obligation, um, they had to bring the passenger to its destination 
and they have the right not to carry a passenger who is late or that has unacceptable baggage or that hasn't paid the ticket. So uh, uh, the obligations, my obligations as a client must ensure preconditions and my rights as a client may benefit from post conditions. And the supplier's obligations um, must ensure post conditions and the supplier's rights may assume preconditions. So for a structure of a contract, uh, obligations in this case are expressed via precondition and post conditions. A precondition is usually a required clause. Um, and this characterizes the responsibility of the program that calls the method. And for the post condition that is usually an insured clause, it characterizes the responsibility of the program that implements the method. So we have that if the precondition is true when a method is called, and then the method will terminate returning to the calling program. And the post condition will be true when it does return. And also, is the, if the precondition is not true when a method is called, uh, that method may do nothing. So here, here we have uh, an example in a piece of code in an EFL version. It is a routine called put uh, of the class dictionary, dictionary where we have a, a value that um, can be inserted in the dictionary and will be retrievable through a key. So we can see here the required clause. It is introducing an input condition or a precondition. And the ensure clause that um, introduces an output condition or a post condition. Both, both of these conditions are example of assertions or contract clauses associated with software elements. Here in the required clause, in the precondition, we have uh, set that the that count uh, is the current number of elements and capacity is the maximum number. So uh, at the beginning of the program, we need to make sure that this that that this is true. And for the post condition, the ensure clause um, has is the boolean query, which tells whether a certain element is present and item returns the element associated with a certain key. So after executing some commands, uh, we need to make sure that at the end we, we meet um, these rules too. So back in Ariane's case, uh, we have also a piece of code in Eiffel version. We can see um, Um, we have added a required clause um, before a piece of code um, saying that the horizontal bias is not, should not be greater than the maximal bias. Uh, so does this mean that the crash would have automatically have been, uh, been avoided um, by having the mission use a language and method supporting building assertions and design by contract? It is a bold thing to say, but maybe. So how can all this theory help? Um, we as developers uh, seek for several things when we are writing programs. One of them is quality, so that's why I really like this quote. And the other, the other one is reliability. There are two things that we can highlight from reliability. One is robustness and the other one is correctness. For robustness, we have that robust software acts acceptably in cases in which it cannot do what it's supposed to do. And for correctness, we have that correct software does what it's supposed to do and just that. So for example, if I want to check my balance, uh, my, my balance of my bank account online, I should be able to do so um, without incrementing or reducing the or reducing my balance in my bank account. So there are several ad advantages for using uh, design by contract. Uh, one of them is assertions, precondition and post conditions 
uh, can be automatically turned on during testing. It, all this through a simple um, compiler, compiler options and errors might, might be cut then. Also, assertions can remain turned on during execution, triggering exceptions if violated. And assertions are a prime component of software and it automatically can produce documentation. So for language support, there are several implementations of the sideband contract libraries for some languages like PHP, C++, C++ Ruby, um, Java, and JavaScript. And there are also several languages that have native support for the sideband contract uh, like Clojure, Racket, Ada, or Eiffel software. I've just seen, I've, uh, I've given um, some examples in, in Eiffel's version because uh, when they were great writing these this Eiffel language, they were the, one, the ones that started using and coined the design by contract term and in fact they are the ones that have, uh, that have it, um, that have the trademark of design by contract. So how can we do, we can achieve something similar in Elixir. Um, for this, um, we, we, we have a library that is in progress um, that is work in progress uh, for the design bank contracts in Elixir and we could be able to do this be, um, with the help of meta programming in Elixir macros so there's, here's the cover of the meta programming Elixir uh, from uh, written by Chris McCord who, uh, who gave an awesome keynote and we can really recommend it if you want to learn a lot more about macros and how to use them, uh, you can come to this, to this book. So for macros, um, they have a set of rules and one particular rule, the first rule of the macro system is don't grind macros. So you may hear this rule uh, loudly when talking to other, to other programmers about metaprogramming. Uh, remember that writing code that writes code um, uh, can produce, uh, you have to do it with special care. Um, macros also can uh, be difficult to debug and reason about. And you have to use it when you're sure that there is clear, clear advantage uh, over using standard functions. So for the second rule of macros, we have that use macros gratuitously. So why would this, the first rule say that don't use macros and the second rule say use them like they're, they're free? So if, if you think about it, uh, maybe the, first, uh, the rule in, in Fight Club about not talking about Fight Club was about learning how to break rules. So. Uh, for this, we have that after you've learned uh, how to use the macro system, you can you don't you don't have to be afraid to use them and learn more about it. And also, macros can be used to save time and share functionality in a fun and productive way. So, as as I've been saying, a macro is code that writes code. It also allows domain-specific language abstractions and provides the freedom to extend the language. Um, many constructs in Elixir are macros, uh, like def, if, unless, def model, between others, and you may have seen them. Um, also, uh, if they are used appropriately, uh, macros offer effective model composition and code generation, generation techniques. So the Elixir code uh, runs at compile time and can be used to manipulate the language AST. Um, the majority of you may already know what, in, what is an AST. It is the abstraction six syntax tree. Uh, it's the representation of code in its own data structure. So the building block of an Elixir program is a tuple of three elements where the first element is an atom um, or another tuple in the same representation. The second element 
is sorry, a keyword, um, a keyword list containing metadata, um, line numbers, and context. And the third element of the of of this is either a list of arguments for the function called or an atom. And when it is an atom, it means that um, the topo represents a variable. So uh, for building the library, we had we have to to take advantage and use the quote macro. So you can get the representation of any expression by using this this quote. So here we have an example of uh, the method sum with the arguments one to three, and when we do quote over it, uh, we get the AST. And you can get, as I said, you can get a representation of any expression by using this. The first element is the function name. The second element is the list of metadata, which uh, containing metadata, which in this case is empty. And the third element is the argument list. And while quote is about retrieving the inner representation of some particular chunk of code, unquote is used, is used to inject some particular chunk of code inside the representation we want to retrieve. So in this example, we have a number 13 and um, we want to inject it in the representation of the quote to at the end get uh, get it as a string as uh, as in the last line 11 plus 30. So back to design by contracts uh, what we had to do to build the library for Elixir was uh, we used these macros to extend the language and add support for the design by contract constructs. We also tagged existing functions with requires and ensure tags. Also, um, mac the macros can manipulate function body to insert preconditions and post conditions inside <coughs> the functions. So in the library, uh, you can see this is an example um, on, how, on how the contracts uh, look in the library we've built. Uh, we have to do, we have to redefine the def clause, uh, support the tags required and ensures that are the pre and post conditions. And in the ensure clause, you can see that we need the number to be in a certain range. So this, you can see that it's a little bit like pattern matching. So for the demo, we um, we want to use the example of filling a tank on how to properly fill a tank. So we have this contract test um, model, and we define the struct of a tank, which you can see there. We also had to um, we have to pay attention to the use clause and make it um, know how to use the contract, the contract library. And this is an example of the, well, the definition of the fill method that it's going to fill the tank. And we have above it the require and the ensure clause. For the require clause or the precondition, um, we have that at first the tank should be full the involve should be opened and the outvolve should be closed. And for the post condition, uh, we need to ensure that at the end the tank will be will be will be full. The involve uh, should be closed and the outvolve should be closed too. And we have a, a test for this. Um, here we have. Uh, we're giving it a tank that has level 10. So the tank is already, it's already full. And as tests are supposed to meet our preconditions, this is going to be a failing test because we need uh, an empty tank or maybe half a uh, half full tank 
um, to first uh, try to fill it. And we also have a, um, a definition of a function empty where we have uh, again the required clause and the short clause above it and for the precondition we require that the in valve is closed and the out valve is opened and we need to ensure that at the end uh, the tank will be empty, empty and the in valve will be closed the out valve will be also closed so, so. and um, here is the command that um, that is inside the definition of the empty function. Um, it says that for the tank to be closed, it should be level one. Uh, for the tank to be empty, it should be level one. But we all know that uh, for it to be empty, it it has to be uh, level zero. So this is a failing command, and the test is going to fail here. This is the test for for the empty function because it uh, we need to assert um, that the tank is uh, is empty so 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 here we have you s tell me if you can see it all the way in the back or maybe I should. We have um, the um, the contract test um, model that I talked to you about. The fill uh, the fill method and the empty method. The methods that I say that if a tank is full or empty, and we have here the two tests that right now are failing because of the reasons that I said before. So right now we are going to test, the, to test run these tests and we can see that the, both of them are failing, as I said. Uh, first, the first one, the field, the field test is failing and it says that the precondition is not met and we have to blame the client because it is using it the wrong way. So, if we change here, that at first the tank should not be already f full, but, sorry, but in level five, and we run the test again, <coughs> we can see that um, the first test is not failing anymore. And for the second test in the empty function, we have that the post condition has not been met. So you have to blame yourself because you are doing something in the code that is not right, and that the, the post condition is telling you to do something, but it's not, but you're not doing it that way. So for this, we change this line of code saying that at the end of, of this function, the tank is not, is not going to be level one anymore, but level zero. And when we run it again, we can see that now the two tests are passing. So, yeah. So um, this is still a work in progress library and you can find it in, in this repo, Elixir by contracts. Um, we are uh, right now, at the right, we're going to try use it, use it for <coughs> the the programs that we have, and right now in Elixir to see how it goes. And 
We have also a list of further work that we want to do uh, with this library. So I, add, I, as I said at first, you should be able to generate test cases from these contracts. Also, at the configuration options to turn off, on and off the contracts in development and production environments. Also, uh, we need to make this generate automated documentation uh, uh, from these contracts and generate quick chest tests. So to conclude, um, we have that design by contract does not replace regular testing and, and strategies. It um, contracts at an extra grade of reliability and it's not a silver bullet. Uh, rather, it complements the external testing with internal self-tests that can be activated both for, uh, for isolated tests um, in, production, in production and code during some test phase. So these are the reference uh, we use, the Ariane's case, design by contract history, if you want to know a little bit more about Hort's logic, design by contract, uh, the examples in, in EFO versions. And thank you very much.